So going over the Tokugawa Shogunate again, so I figured uh, it would be good to get all this down on a video so that we can spend more time in class looking at primary documents and then the lecture can take place at home. So we did some of this in class, but let's just reiterate all of it. Um, realize that before the Tokugawa Shogunate period, uh, Japan was experiencing about a century-long period of, uh, of chaos and instability. Um, just like pre-Han China, um, or actually, sorry, pre-Chin China, rather, um, you are dealing with a warring states period. Um, Japan calls, called it the Sengoku period, and that happened from 1467 to 1573. So basically, the country was in a state of lawlessness and chaos. Um, it was a large-scale civil war where various uh, daimyos, who were all um, basically the heads of noble families, were fighting one another. And uh, this is just giving you a sense of how decentralized the government was. So when you go from region to region, there was a different daimyo who was in control, and none of them at, up until this point had actually consolidated power. And so it was a very chaotic time to be living in Japan. Um, but what starts to happen, um, which is what the Tokugawa shogunate actually is, is a period of unification. So this starts in 1568, and there were three men who are credited as being the reunifiers of Japan. So we're going to talk about all three of them briefly. Um, Oda Nobunaga, Oda Nobunaga, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. I really have to work on my Japanese. Um, so Nobunaga is first. Um, Nobunaga was uh, a very powerful daimyo. And uh, so he used his army of samurai to take over Kyoto, which at that point was, um, was the city that the emperor lived in. So it was effectively serving as a capital. Um, after he secured Kyoto, he forced daimyos from surrounding lands to submit to him. So he gained even more land by doing this. And uh, he did not uh, remain in power for very long. He was assassinated in 1582. But before he was, he consolidated about a third to one half of the lands that make up modern day Japan. Um, then his successor was uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi. And uh, he actually came from less noble blood. So, um, so Nobunaga, and then we'll talk about Ieyasu in a second, they were both from daimyo families. But actually Hideyoshi was a farmer who turned into a daimyo. So some people actually challenged uh, his ability to be a ruler because of his humble background. But in any case, he did ultimately prove himself to be a very worthy warrior. Um, and he eventually became a very powerful daimyo who replaced Nobunaga. And he continued to expand territory. And when he, was, when he died, uh, his lands basically made up all of modern Japan. Um, when he died in 1598, uh, the center of power shifts to Edo, which was a small fishing village at the time. But this is eventually going to become Tokyo. But what's really important about these two men, uh, Nobunaga and Hideyoshi, is how they join Japan together. So this, all this stuff in red is the land that uh, Nobunaga was able to consolidate. Okay, And then after that, you see that Toyotomi was able to ultimately get the rest of Japan under his control. And after Hideyoshi dies, uh, the next leader of Japan, and arguably the most important, and I didn't emphasize him enough in class, so this is another reason why I really wanted to make this video, um, Tokugawa Ieyoshi, or sorry, I can speak, Tokugawa Ieyasu, Tokugawa Ieyasu, okay, he was one of the most important figures of the Tokugawa shogunate, so please, please, please be familiar with him. Okay, so he also was a very powerful daimyo, daimyo um, and he ended up um, defeating all the remaining daimyo who were loyal to Hideyoshi. Okay, so basically he takes over all this land that Hideyoshi was going to give to his son. So it actually was a takeover of power. Okay, when Ieyasu takes over, he is going to move the capital to Edo, which becomes Tokyo. Um, and in 1603, he is really proven to be a worthy em uh, ruler because the emperor, by the way, the emperor of Japan is more or less a puppet. He's only a figurative ruler. Um, he bestows the title of shogun 
upon Eiyasu, which means he's basically like this supreme daimyo. He is a military leader. Basically, in Japan at this period, shoguns were way more important than the emperor was. Okay, so when he was given the title shogun, I mean, essentially, he was the ruler of all Japan, as far as anyone was concerned. Um, when Eiyasu takes over, this marks a new period of Japanese history called the Period of Great Peace. And this lasts until the 19th century. So basically, the Tokugawa shogunate is all the Period of Great Peace. So... Um, how is government uh, situated in the Tokugawa shogunate? Um, well, one of the things that they do uh, after they're able to consolidate all the land under uh, the shogunate instead of all these different daimyos, um, they basically try to structure the land so that they can be uh, that they can be ruled more efficiently. Okay, so the daimyo are not totally unimportant anymore. They just don't have total independent rule over their area, right? They're subject to the shogun now. But basically what they do now is they divide the land up into all these different districts. There were 250 of them, and they're called Hans. Okay, Hans is basically a domain or a territory. Okay, each one of these was controlled by a daimyo, and uh, he had his own army of samurai. And he was fairly independent in ruling his, um, his Hans, but at the same time he still had to do, ultimately, the bidding of the shogun. Um... <clears throat> So um, what's really significant and the way that you see that, that the daimyo was definitely not fully independent was this hostage system. Okay, so basically if you were a daimyo, you had to have two different houses. One of them was located wherever your Hans was, so you were in your actual town. And then the other one was located in Edo, in the capital. Okay, and so basically what that meant was um, if you had to leave the capital for whatever reason, um, the shogun would take your family hostage. Okay, so this wasn't a violent hostage situation, but what that meant was that the daimyo couldn't leave and then try to amass all these rebels against the shogun and then return to the capital and stage a rebellion. Um, the shogun knew that if the daimyo's uh, family was staying in the capital, that he would stay loyal to the shogun. So that worked pretty effectively to uh, keeping the daimyo's under control. Um, one thing that's really important about the Tokugawa shogunate is how strict uh, the social order becomes. So what you see is that there was a little bit more social fluidity during the Civil War era. Um, and um, after this, um, there is a really deliberate effort to make sure that the social order is very clearly outlined. And it's interesting because in some ways you see that there's some um, lingering, maybe uh, it's maybe strange that certain groups are as important as they are. So you see in some ways the unwillingness to change. So on the top of this social order, not surprisingly, is the emperor and the imperial court, right? Even though the emperor was a symbolic leader, at the same time, he still was the highest class, right? And also, an inclu including, um, we're also including the shogun in this category, right? So the emperor, the imperial court, and the shogun are all at the top. And then next to that, um, the next Im most important class are actually the samurai warrior. And this is interesting because in class we were talking about how the samurai warrior class loses a lot of their power because the civil wars end when, Ju uh, when Japan is unified. So a lot of samurai warriors are actually more um, kind of symbolically significant. Um, a lot of them actually end up uh, not having masters. They A lot of them sometimes either roam the countryside, sometimes re uh, resort to crime. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, because they were so high in status, the government tried to change their role in society. So, you know, they had this long-standing warrior tradition, but what the government was trying to do was to get them to become bureaucrats. And uh, this was something that a lot of the samurai were resistant to because it didn't pay as well as being a samurai. And it removed the samurai from that traditional warrior culture. There were certain things about them that clearly made them stand out as soldiers. So, for example, the only people that were allowed to walk around in public wearing swords were the samurai. So to them, it just seemed sort of uh, strange for them to occupy a bureaucratic position when they had such a long-standing military tradition. It did happen nonetheless, and we're going to look at some documents in class about how um, about how uh, bureaucrats were trained in Japan, but at the same time, they didn't really like it in particular. Um, so next, you have... Um, you have the peasants and farmers, which is important because 
you might be surprised by this order. You know, in most European societies, peasants and farmers were at the bottom. Um, but peasants and farmers were actually more important than, um, than artisans and merchants. And this actually, in some ways, is connected to the Confucian traditions that are spreading to Japan. There was something about artisans and merchants that, uh, that the Japanese, as well as the Chinese, found very scary and threatening. First off, they saw it as an opening of their land to the outside world, and they never knew whether or not they might be prone to invasion. And also they saw um, merchants as parasites because they thought that they made their profits from the work of others. Um, so, you know, because they weren't actually feeding people, right, because they were just profiting. Many people saw the merchants as evil and kind of taking away the agricultural tradition of their longstanding history. Um, so what's interesting is that even though as far as the social order is concerned, artisans and merchants were lower, Artisans and merchants, in reality, actually could make more money than peasants and farmers, and sometimes even more money than samurai. So just because the government places them in this position doesn't mean that in reality they actually are this low. And uh, there's going to be a lot of conflict when more Europeans start to make contact with the Eastern world, because ultimately merchants and artisans stand to benefit the most from that. Um, and then Japan also has a class of outcasts, they were called the Eta. And um, basically, they are comparable to untouchables in India. Um, they were ostracized because they performed undesirable jobs like being executioners and butchers. Um, and they were also tightly regulated by the Japanese government. And so they're essentially like serfs or essentially slaves until 1871 when they're emancipated. So, you know, just, just the idea that there is an emancipation shows you what their role in society really was. Okay, so there's a lot of economic development in the Tokugawa shogunate, um, which is very significant because um, during the warring states, uh, their economy was much more stagnant. So one thing is that uh, the Japanese also are getting involved in silk production. They don't actually have the silk raw material. They get that from China, but they actually start to weave silk domestically. So that is going to flourish, and obviously that is going to uh, result in some trade with foreign nations. Um, you also have a large silver mine that actually exists in Japan, one of the largest in the world at that time. Um, the Japanese also start to develop banking and paper currency at this point. And having more money um, actually spurs more commercial development. People can take out loans, people can use them to start their businesses. Um, so having paper money actually really uh, encouraged economic development. Um, the merchant class grew, and we know already that this is despite their low position on the social hierarchy. So that shows us that outside influence on Japan is very strong. Um, you also have an increase in taxes, which means that occasionally peasants would revolt against the government uh, because they were upset. Um, you will see, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a moment, that the government does eventually try to put restrictions on trade uh, because they see, obviously, uh, this to be sort of a threatening exposure to outside worlds. Um, but what happens is that the trade networks already were so well established um, that you still have traders from places like China, the Netherlands, Korea, England, still trying to have influence in Japan even after the government tries to restrict trade. Um, <clears throat> there is also a flourishing uh, art culture that emerges in the Tokugawa area. Um, they, basically, the arts flourish because there is a general elevation of prosperity in this period. Um, you're going to have wealthy merchants and daimyo actually construct elaborate residences. And I'm skipping ahead for a second because I realized that the photo is on this slide. So this is a really good example of a noble residence. Um, they, uh, the sort of competitive warrior nature is manifested in the way that they construct their homes. Um, you see that um, uh, this, and actually there are many taller examples of castles actually that you can see in Japan. Their idea is that the taller it is, the stronger of a defense it has, right? So basically you see that there's this social competition that also exists in, um, in, the, in their living style as well. Okay, back to this slide. Um, you're going to also have a refined uh, Chinese method, uh, the Japanese are going to refine the Chinese method of making woodblock prints, so they're going to have really elaborate, um, elaborate art and calligraphy that, uh, that results um, from their ability to, um, to work, with, um, work with all of these materials. Um, you also have um, very, very significant poetry. 
Um, the great poet of the Tokugawa era, uh, era was named Matsuo Basho, Basho, and he developed the haiku, the 575 structure. And most of his haikus were about nature, obviously, as haikus have developed, they're about many other things, but the haiku is one of the most iconic examples of Japanese poetry, and, and it develops here. So you get a sense of how there's also a sense of leisure and appreciation for one's surroundings in this era. If one can step aside and take a moment to actually write about nature, you can tell that Japan has sort of emerged from that chaotic period of warring states to just stop and really appreciate the greater things in life. And another great example of how culture is flourishing is this novel that is uh, published in 1686 um, called Five Women Who Love Love by Saikaku. And so this was, I mean, clearly not as racy as some romance novels these days, but for its time, it was a very racy um, romance novel, um, but still very down to earth in nature about the exploits and adventures of five different women. And it is very popular, very, very, sells very well, especially among the merchant class. And uh, there are people that argue that the merchants were sort of the more materialistic consumers of the culture. So it's not surprising that they are very excited about this book that involves uh, sort of passion and romance. Another really important uh, cultural development was in the theater. Um, kabuki theater is what it's called. And um, it became very popular with the middle class. Um, they sometimes would spend entire days watching kabuki theater performances. Um, it actually is oftentimes compared to Shakespearean plays in England uh, because they have emerged concurrently. Um, and I wanted to also emphasize the fact that women were excluded from kabuki theater performances. Um, there is very much an emphasis on the nature of the character. Um, you can see that there is an elaborate attention to colors, an elaborate attention to the dramatic makeup that is used by these by these actors. Um, and it was just really an example of how uh, much uh, the culture is able to develop that, you know, people of the middle class have enough leisure that they can consume theatrical performances for fun. So you can see how far they've come from the war in states period. Okay. Um, with that said, it's important for us to realize that women do remain subordinate in Japanese society. Um, women did even um, women did have roles in the warrior class, but at the same time they were restricted through, uh, regardless of what social class they occupied. So even if they were in the highest class, they still weren't as powerful as a male daimyo. daimyo. So there could be female daimyos. They existed, female samurais. Um, but at the same time, they had uh, less status, less regard than their male counterparts. Um, other things, um, very much uh, Confucianism shapes the role of women throughout Japan. Um, you find that um, essentially a, man, a woman's role is defined by her relationship to a man. So she's supposed to respect filial piety when she's growing up in her household and honor her father. Uh, when she marries, though, her honor shifts over to her in-laws. So basically, she has to prefer her mother and father-in-law over her own family. So that gives you a sense of how important marriage is for a woman, um, and for families, for that matter. Marriages were also often used as tools to link strong families together, so marriages were often arranged. Um, men were able to divorce women if they didn't fulfill their duties, but women could not seek divorce. Um, and uh, men controlled all property, which meant that if a woman had property in her family, if she married, uh, her husband would gain all of the control of, of it. And women, their biggest value was as mothers, right? So you can definitely compare the role of women in, um, in Japan to the role of women in China. There's still very much this restricted sense of, of women in both of these societies, and they're both very much influenced by Confucianism. Okay. So what's really important about the Tokugawa shogunate is that there is a huge introduction to, <clears throat> to Europeans in this era. This is the late 16th, early 17th century. So this is really the peak of the age of exploration for Western European countries. And so in the uh, mid 15th century, the first Portuguese traders uh, make contact with Jap Japan. And at first, uh, they're actually welcomed and they trade pretty openly with the Japanese. Um, the Japanese were fascinated by especially their weapons. They had never seen guns before, but they were also interested in other manufactured goods, things like clocks and other gadgets. 
Um, they obviously really, they enjoyed tobacco the same way that Western Europeans did um, and other fine products that they were not used to. So trade at first was very much encouraged. Um, after traders touched base though, missionaries soon followed and that's where things got a little bit more dicey. So, um, so Christian missionaries were at first tolerated and uh, thousands of new converts to Christianity um, uh, were introduced into Japanese society. Um, but the problem is that this introduction of Christianity to Japan was a huge challenge to the previously established religions in Japan. So the new converts to Christianity were instructed not to maintain any traditional religious customs. So you actually had the destruction of Buddhist shrines in this era. Um, and uh, there's also um, a huge bash backlash at the Christian community by the shogun himself. So this is very early. This is when Hideyoshi was still alive. So this is actually before Ayayasu is even shogun. When uh, Hideyoshi uh, realizes that Jesuits were actually actively destroying Buddhist property, he responded by, um, by banning Christian worship completely. Um, so when he does that, missionaries were subsequently expelled from China. China, good grief. They were subsequently expelled from Japan, rather. Um, after the missionaries were removed, you also have the severe restriction of trade in Japan with European countries. But at the same time, it's really important for us to realize that the door had already been opened and there's still significant European interest in Japan. You do have the restriction of most traders, with the exception of one Dutch group, but they had um, some significant restrictions on their trade. But still, this shows us that the threat that Christianity posed to the traditional Japanese practices, particularly Buddhism, was enough to close that door on most European contact. There were also laws that resulted after this period that really tried to discourage foreigners from making contact with Japanese and also to discourage Japanese from venturing outside of the country. Okay, so by the 1630s, nearly all foreigners had been expelled from the country. They forbade foreign books. Um, they made it illegal for Japanese people to travel abroad. Um, they also even banned uh, how they banned how many uh, sorry they regulated how many sails you could have on your ship. So if you had more than two sails on your ship, that basically meant that your ship would be large enough to go across the deep sea. And so they restricted what kinds of ships you could build so that you couldn't actually go too far. Um, so essentially, these rules that I just said out loud and these rules that are listed give you a sense of how the government responded to the foreign presence in Japan. And how does the Tokugawa shogunate decline? Um, so there's a number of things. Uh, a lot of it is actually because of the influx of foreign people, ideas, and money. What it really does is it disrupts that traditional J Japanese lifestyle. We know that there was an attempt to get rid of outsiders. Um, we already said that in the, in the 1630s um, that all of the foreigners had essentially been expelled, but realize that that only lasts for a few hundred years. By the mid-19th century, again, you were going to have foreigners uh, attempt to trade, uh, trade in Japan. Um, so what you're going to have in the 1800s is another attempt to expel outsiders. Um, the emperor at the time um, issues an order to expel, he calls them barbarians, which is interesting. Um, so you see, um, you see that that ultimately is sort of an order that happened too late. Um, when the emperor tried to expel the foreign barbarians, it did nothing. Um, foreign warships continued uh, to actually have a military presence in Japanese ports and ships, and uh, these places were still open for foreign trade. And after the Tokugawa shogunate formally ends, uh, the Meiji Restoration period, we see a very quick attempt for the Japanese to modernize their military, and they often adopt Western techniques. So there's a little bit of an opening of the door to the West at that point. Um, the anti-Western daimyos actually blamed the shogunate for not being able to defend against foreign invaders. Um, so by the time uh, the Sh Tokugawa shogunate formally ends in 1867, when the last Tugugawa shogun uh, resigns. 
And as I said earlier, this marks a new period of Japanese history called the Meiji Restoration, where the emperor actually gains a lot more power. And the, sh uh, the shoguns or the daimyos are no longer going to be um, significant rulers. So, so hopefully that was thorough. I, I apologize for uh, butchering so many Japanese pronunciations. I'm also going to give you the notes for this so that if you need help following along, you'll have those. But my hope is that this will give you a better understanding of the content so we can move right into primary document analysis. Okay, thank you.